So just to put everything in sort of a little bit of a framework, I'm going to draw your attention. If you might turn your seats around, there's a little video to put Jim Roselli into perspective. Instead of going to my lecture today, go back to your cabins <laughs> and try a new position. Those of you who have a partner, I know I'm a widow. I know very well that there are many widows, more widows than widowers. And I will say something later on about that. I don't have a solution for that. I'm not saying I'm old fashioned in the square. Don't walk around and pick up somebody else's men. I would raise my eyebrows. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Ruth, okay, here I go. Are you ready? How many positions are there? <laughs> endless, because the human mind is endless in its imagination. And now, somebody of a certain age, Jim, mm -hmm. cannot hang from a chandelier anymore. <laughs> positions you have to say, not for me now. However, it's endless. A few years ago, my career would have ended with that. <laughs> <laughs> But today, as they say, the tagging kiss at you. Yeah, that's it. Sex without love. It's a lonesome thing. <laughs> but as lonesome things go, <laughs> it's way up there. <laughs> I love, I'm going to listen to her lecture. We're at 1045. We'll be over there. And ever, ever the sex therapist, right now as we speak, Dr. Ruth is over at the Athenaeum helping a gentleman get the cap off of his Viagra bottle. <laughs> Did you see, by the way, it's amazing the way the institution schedules these theme weeks. They had a, a, a sex therapy week about three years ago. We, we, we called it Nostalgia Week here at Chautauqua. <laughs> <laughs> and in yesterday's New York Times, there's a front page article about how seniors are having rampant sex more than ever before. Ever, in fact, they're going to redo Sex in the City. This time around, <laughs> it's going to star Wilfred Brimley and Betty White. <laughs> and so the whole idea, because I've listened to these these lectures, you know, and, and the whole idea, it's romance. As I say, yeah, sex without love is romance. But it's, it's with two partners, right? Notice I said partners because, you know, and so, <laughs> but the whole idea, don't use the word, no, I'm not going to use it. The whole idea <laughs> is to create a romantic atmosphere, soft lights, candlelight, romantic music, and this is the most important, selecting just the right Halloween mask. <laughs> so you always worry about whether I can, whether I'm going to pause for commercials or not. You I worry <laughs> because it's your livelihood. You know, right. if, if we all worry if we go a little too long. I say, oh my goodness, they don't have a commercial coming. Yeah, up we there. got commercials coming, and, and poor Jim's going to have to go door to door. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. let it roll. We pass. Yeah. This book, by the way, for those who have uh, not received it yet, it's 190, 190 pages, chock full of personal reflections, interview highlights, and, and a community outpouring of everything that you know Jim Roselli has, has meant to us. And, and Jim, I, just to start off, when you saw this book, I mean, at some point, there, there's, they pull it out of the box, Bill or Walt hand it to you, and you see the finished product. Well, what is your reaction? Well, let me first say that uh, a book was never in my future. I wasn't going to write a book. But when you get two people, three people, like Bill Locke and Pat Locke, and then you get Walter involved, and uh, Pat 
persuasive powers that she had <laughs> with her husband <laughs> and decides that a 60-year career and a 40-year career at Chautauqua deserves a book. And they came to me with that idea and they had the cooperation of Walt from the Gazette and he was willing to do it. How do you say no? <laughs> How do you say no to that? I just simply said, if you're that courageous, <laughs> let me put it that way, and you think there's a story there, uh, I'd be happy to share it with you. There's a lot to this story. I mean, you've uh, not only reflected back on your family, your yeah. literally your life and times concerning the going to college, uh, you exposed some personal things regarding yep. a couple of surgeries you had. Mm -hmm. uh, your mother's deep love and affection uh -huh. towards you. It's uh, you can can't you, you can't say enough about my mother. You can't you can't say enough about her. Uh, I've told this story before. Walt, Pat, and uh, they've all heard it. But I uh, I'll tell it again. When you look back and realize, stop and think again, I'm going to say it, when you stop and think of a, a young 21-year-old girl leaving her home in Sicily, she's leaving and coming to America. Her brothers are here, her brother is here, and her two sisters. And the idea in that day was to come here, make some money, and then go back home with a little bit of cash to help the family. But she gets here not married. She meets my father here. It's in the book. He's pushing the cart through the neighborhood with fruits and vegetables. And my father inquired who she was and got acquainted. And here we are, seven <laughs> children later. <laughs> you know. But the thing I point out is she couldn't read, she couldn't write, and she couldn't speak English. So how do you raise seven children with what you would think is a big handicap? Jim, you, you raise it with love, that's it. Talk about love. You react, you know, you've given so much to the community. That's why we're here today. That's why uh, there's nobody more iconic in our community than Jim Roselli. And, but at some point in your early years, there had to be a tipping point. Something which triggered saying, you know, I, yes, I'll be off to St. Lawrence. Yes, I may be floating around, but Jamestown, New York is a good place to invest my time and energy. Well, you know, when you picture a career you think may be possible, and particularly in radio, uh, sure, uh, Greg, I had the dream of uh, doing <laughs> Notre Dame football <laughs> and giant baseball. That was my, after I heard Bill Stern on the radio doing college football, Notre Dame, and I thought the way he created the excitement of the game. You know, here we go with radio, the greatest thing for imagination. And he created that imagination in my mind of how he made that game exciting. And I thought, gee, I, I'm not going to be able to play it professionally. I'm not going to be able to write about it. But maybe I can announce about it. And I thought, let's try. Let's give it a shot. Well, talking about being an athlete, you were, in fact, the quarterback of your fraternity team uh -huh. in St. Lawrence. And at one time, you had an opportunity to play against an individual <laughs> who also was a quarterback yeah. of another, I think, fraternity. Uh, why don't you talk about that story? Well, it so happened that they had a, uh, a touch football league at St. Lawrence. You know, two-hand touch instead of tackle. And it, every fraternity played every other fraternity. But they also played a dorm team, those that didn't join fraternities. 
and we had this particular day we're going to meet this dorm team and they had this well I wasn't aware of who they had as a quarterback but when we got to the field to play the game here's this guy about 62 you know and uh, he's throwing the football he can throw it 30 40 yards without any problem here's little Roselli throwing the football I can make 15 yards you know and but we had to play each other and they beat us 35 to nothing <laughs> but the interesting thing is he was there on a short one-term education for him because he played with the Jersey City Giants that was a farm club of the New York Giants in the International League and he was there at St. Lawrence to finish his education and then go back to playing Major League Baseball or he was he wasn't aware he's going to get to the majors because he had to go back to Jersey City well we leave school in 49 and in 1951 this man is playing for the New York Giants do you all know the rest of the story? No, no. You don't? You don't know the rest of the story? Uh, I'll give you, can I give him a clue? Pardon? Can I give him a, a radio cue and clue? Sure. The Giants win the pennant. The Giants win the pennant. Eight times. That's right. Russ Hodges. Russ Hodges said that eight times because this man, this player, was Bobby Thompson, the man who hit the home run to beat the Brooklyn Dodgers in that game and put the Giants in the World Series. And here I played football against them. Yeah. Hence your long-standing interest in the Giants? No. <laughs> They've given me heartache ever since. Oh, well, they gave the heartache to the Detroit, my yeah, Detroit Tigers yeah, a couple yeah. years ago, so no, no penny here. Uh, Last time that it's written in the book uh, that Jim and I had an opportunity to do this was at a rotary function, mm -hmm. and I got my first question out, and about a half an hour later, I was able to get my second question. <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of guy. This is not easy, interviewing the ultimate interviewer. <laughs> but it also reminded me of a story that's also in this book where you were talking with your sidekick, Tom Morgan, from Paris. That's right. And... Uh, Tom Morgan was, you were chatting, and Tom says, I'm in the middle of having coffee here, and my waitress had just delivered the coffee. And what did you say next? I said, let me speak to the waitress. <laughs> and? And I did. <laughs> and and Tom was still waiting for his order. <laughs> 20 minutes later, Tom yeah, says Tom, he finally got yeah. back to the question. <laughs> you know, Often, Jim, because uh, you have done this for so many years, I know that retirement becomes a question, like, will you ever retire? Right. And then you recall a story uh, <laughs> that you did think of retirement once, <laughs> and then you met a lady. Yes. And she had a conversation with you. Right. What'd she say? Well, I was doing a show on the road, which I did a lot of. I was at Super Duper, and this lady came to the store, and just walked up and paused in front of me and just looked at a while and, and just quickly said, you're Jim Roselli. And I said, yes, I am. And she said, I want to tell you something. And I said, what is it? She said, every morning I roll over in bed and turn you on. <laughs> I postponed my retirement. <laughs> what else can I tell you? <laughs> That's the truth. Every time I tell that story, people are suspicious. But believe me, that's exactly the way she phrased it. Bob Terryberry now he wants to become a radio announcer. <laughs> <laughs> I saw him write the note. Chautauqua, you are, Jim Roselli is identified with Chautauqua, and Chautauqua identified with Jim Roselli. Right. However, your persistence is how you initially got there. Yes. Uh, yeah. um, I just told Tim Maines, is he here, or did he leave? He, he left. I just told uh, Tim Maines, the superintendent of schools, how 
how that all came about. And there's a, a, a saying I use often, uh, because when you look back on your life, uh, you realize if you do become a success, you have not done it alone. You have not done it alone. You look back because you're fortunate that there were the right people at the right time in the right place to give you the support, to give you the inspiration to do anything they can to help you along. And that's what happened here with Chautauqua. Uh, my high school class president was Charles Goodell, our former congressman, our former senator when Bobby Kennedy got assassinated. And we followed his career. And so as I was looking over a program one year back in 1974, I was looking at the advanced schedule of Chautauqua's programs. And I saw on there, at one of the dates, Charles Goodell will speak on the abuse of government power. If you don't know, he was one of the first voices against the Vietnam War. And when it came time for the election after Nelson Rockefeller appointed him senator to fill the vacancy created by the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, he filled the rest of the term. But Richard Nixon did not want him to be the candidate for the next election. He chose James Buckley. So Charles Goodell ran as an independent and of course didn't win. So it, as we know what happened to Nixon and, and government power, Charlie was out giving talks about the abuse. When I saw that, I just simply left work and decided to drive to Chautauqua and ask for permission to do a broadcast that particular period where Charlie was going to be the speaker. I just wanted permission to do a show because I felt the community would like to hear Charlie again. He's got a message. He's my high school class president. He was our congressman. He was our senator. And the community, I felt, would want to hear what has happened to Charlie's life since then. And so I went and asked. And they inquired, well, how are you going to do it? And I said, I, I can take any little area. I don't take up much room. I'm 5'7", 130 pounds, you know. But uh, I said, and I do a three-hour show, but I, I'm sure I felt confident Charlie would give me an interview. We were friends in school. We played ball against each other. And so they said, well, we don't see a problem with that. Well, where do you want to locate? And I said, well, let's just use the that little patio on off of Bester Plaza. I'll just get into the corner there. I won't take up much room, and you still have the rest of the patio for the customers of the restaurant. And so they agreed to it. I got back to the studio and told them that I had gotten permission. <laughs> and uh, let me it, it, maybe my, some of you will understand this. When you talk to a sales manager, and ask him or tell him you, you want to do a broadcast, the first question they ask, are we going to be able to get any commercials on there? <laughs> there we are. That's a salesman for you. And I said, Carl, even if we don't get commercials, it's worth doing the show. How can you turn down an opportunity not for the community not to hear their representatives? and tell about his experience. And he said, okay, let's do it. And it was supposed to be a one-week show, one week, because Charlie was going to speak twice during the week. But remember, I'm doing a three-hour show. Even if I get Charlie, I still have two and a half hours <laughs> to fill. So I 
I don't hesitate. You know, I call it the invisible lasso. You know, when people pass me by, they don't really pass me by because I stop them. <laughs> you know, and I just ask them to come over. But at Chautauqua, you've got the world at your doorstep. You've got people coming there from all over the world. You've got people coming from every state in the Union. So to me, and you've heard this or we'll read it, everybody is a story. Everybody. There are no two people alike in this world. Your chemistry is different. Your interests are different. Your experiences are different. That's a story. You don't have to be a celebrity to be a story. You're a story. You've got years on this planet, and you've done something with them. You've encountered many situations, and it's a pleasure for me to, to try to get that out of you and let somebody hear a story. So I naturally, but I did one thing that was so important. Winnie Llewellyn was a, teach, is a, was a teacher at the time at Maple Grove High School. But she was the hostess at the Wensley House in Chautauqua. That's where the guests stay. Any celebrity coming there, giving a lecture or whatever, stays at the Wensley. And she's the hostess that welcomes them. And I saw Winnie, and I said, Winnie, can you talk anybody into coming on my show? Can you get one of those celebrities, you know, bring him over? And I said, just. Just tell them they'll be on radio 10 or, or 15 minutes. Well, much to my surprise, who does she bring over one of the days? Margaret Mead, oh the anthropologist. Here I am <laughs> with a huge celebrity getting an opportunity. She then brings over Dr. Bernard, Christian Bernard, the man who made the first, first heart transplant in the world. I get an opportunity to interview him. In the meantime, I'm picking out people that were from Timbuktu and uh, Kokomo, Indiana, wherever they're from. And we did the show. There, the week is over. I go back to the studio Monday, and I'm called into the office. And they said, we've had what they call in radio feedback people commenting about what you did last week. They seem to enjoy that opportunity. Would you like to go back? You know what I said? Is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> I said, I don't want to go back for one week. And they said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go back every week. Because every week is a different subject different personalities, different opportunities. And they agreed that I could go back, but I had to only go three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, because Thursday and Friday, Joe Caprino always bought those shows. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if some of you may not know, but Joe Caprino was a furniture man here. Uh, it's in the book, The Story of Joe, about him living in my neighborhood and uh, he came from um, Italy, and uh, he started a little radio repair shop in the, in, in, the, in the neighborhood. He had a little sun porch. And then he started selling televisions, and then he started a furniture store, and then he bought radio, thanks to Merrill Rosen. He bought a lot of radio. Mm -hmm. He had me at his store. He was in the business 37 years, and I probably did. In 37 years, I'm giving you a rough guess, but I probably did a thousand shows from his store. Where the best cost less. less. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, if you could get a parrot and you could bring it to the store, and the parrot will say, Go, go, go see Joe, you get a television set. <laughs> Yeah, that was a promotion. Yeah. 
Yeah. He had all kinds of promotions. He had a 64-hour marathon, nonstop, open all night. You'll, I don't want to give you the book away. <laughs> Read the book. Hey, speaking of guests, uh, this is just these a couple of short snorters, but uh, you had Jane Goodall. Yes. And your first question to her was, can you hoot like a chimpanzee? <laughs> and her response? She did. She did it. She did it. Do you remember I, how she I'm did not, it? I'm not going to try to imitate her. No. But she did. Sure. It's well, the, not in the book, but uh, I should put a CD in there. <laughs> but she hooted. Well, I, I also you uh, you had a, you never know. The nice thing of when you, when you're a lawyer, you should know the, every answer to every question before yeah. you ask it. That isn't the case when Jim's on the radio. He was uh, interviewing Freeman Dyson, the great physicist. Right. And this was during his first interview, and he knew, because he did his research and homework, that uh, the famous scientist of all time, Albert Einstein, and Freeman Dyson's past, uh, paths had crossed. Do you remember what happened next? Uh, you said, what do you think of Albert Einstein? Uh, right. And uh, He called him a... Go ahead. S-O-B. <laughs> yeah. And that sort of stopped that conversation. It probably almost stopped my career. <laughs> Not much of a follow-up there. You know, you, you mentioned the fact that you uh, uh, can't do things alone. You can't, no. And I think one of the great assists that you had, and it's in the book, is the men's room interview <laughs> yeah. you had with a Hall of Fame manager. Right. Could you Dick, talk Will about Dick Williams. I knew he was in town. He was a um, manager of the Boston Red Sox, wasn't he, Greg? Yeah. yeah. Yes. And he was at the town club for lunch, and I knew he was there, and I asked for permission to take a tape recorder down and try to get an interview with him. I wasn't certain I was going to get it, but at least I was going to make the effort anyway. So uh, I quickly ran down to the uh, town club, and it was busy. The, the entire room was busy with diners during the lunch hour. And uh, I quickly introduced myself to Dick Williams, and I said, let's find a, a quiet place where we can have an interview. And so we went upstairs. and. Uh, the upstairs was busy with a banquet, and there was no room there to be quiet. And Dick said, why don't we go to the men's room? <laughs> and I thought, okay, <laughs> we'll go to the men's room. So we went to the men's room. I put the recorder on the sink and the AC plug, and nobody was in there at the time. Nobody, just us two. And I started the interview. Then the door opened and somebody came in. And believe it, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Here I am with, the, with Dick Williams at a sink, and here's the urinal right here. The stand-up urinal, you know. It's a men's room. <laughs> yeah, it's a men's room. And the gentleman came in to do his duty. Believe it or not, Williams is answering the question, and he's doing his duty. And I thought, they're going to hear Niagara Falls on the radio. I thought, oh my God. And he completed it. And as he left the room, he was leaving the room, he suddenly stopped. And I could see him out of the corner of my eye. He took out a piece of paper and he wrote something on it. And then as I was continuing the interview, he just handed it to me. And then he left the room. And as Dick Williams is answering my question, I looked at the piece of paper quickly, and it said, nobody will ever believe this. <laughs> and Dick Williams, I showed it to him afterwards, and he saw it, and he said, I'm taking this story on the road. Try to top that one. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, one of the things Mark Russell said in this preamble, and, uh, and I'll share this because I think it's just 
so appropriate that, because uh, Jim, you're known for not only your in, uh, intense ability to prepare, but to also be fair. I mean, uh, you bring out the best in folks. You're not somebody who has, Mark Russell, and I'll read this, that you, know, you, you are folksy. Let's just say that Jim Roselli is the last AM radio talk show host on earth, never to utter the words scumbag, thug, <laughs> sleazeball, or bottom feeder when describing a public figure. He is your Jamestown neighbor who knows what is going on in Tibet. <laughs> He's the guy with the groceries at the checkout counter who can rattle off the names of all nine Supreme Court justices, and not only because he has interviewed some of them, including Oliver Wendell Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> but this makes Jim an incredible individual. And I think I speak for everybody here, Jim, that you have done more for this community as an ambassador, Ooh. as an institution. I know, you know you're going to say, no, 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 no. But it's so true because you have the benefit of the microphone every day. Mm -hmm. All of us around here, and there's a lot of interesting people in the crowd here, all do things variously at various times. But you are the continuity, that continuum, and it happens every day. You got to get up for it, and you mm -hmm. do your research. And I, I just want to just pause and give you an applause for all of that. That's just unbelievable. <laughs> And, and bef before I'm going to ask you, because I know people want to get books signed, and because I want you to sign off like you normally do in just a second, but before you do so, let, let me read this. And uh, this is so appropriate. This was a poem, and it says, and it's entitled Jim Roselli, I know a man from Jamestown. He's been here all his years, and this is just the perfect time to give him all your cheers. Jim Roselli is the guy He's of whom I speak, knows just how to say the words. He's always at his peak. He's the voice of Jamestown. The radio is his way of keeping all folks up to date as they start their day. He has his cup of happiness. It's his own thing with style. We sit at home and join him as he brings us a smile. You see, his heart is full of gold. It's seen in every story. Local folks and big names, too, they all get equal glory. In the summer, Bester Plaza is where Jim can be found. To share Chautauqua with the world, no other can be found. And now it's 55 years that Jim's been on the air, and we want 55 more. We think that's only fair. So each and every morning, we all wake up with Jim, and since he gives his heart to us, we now give ours to him. And if so, our biggest wish for you, we know that you'll employ, when you go through life each day, just live, just live, love, and enjoy. Yeah. Kathleen J Joy to Jim yeah. Roselli. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, of course, the, the foundation for that is a, a simple piece of philosophy, I mean, the way I look at it. Um, I look at it this way. We're here on this planet for what I call a short time. We're not here long. My sister celebrated yesterday her 97th birthday. 97 were the two left from my family. My sister, 97, I'm 88. We've lost five, we've lost three sisters and two brothers. And uh, even as that, life is too short. Why in the world, in that amount of time that you're here and it's so short, why should there be moments of hate, prejudice, uh, revenge? Why not take the attitude, take the, uh, the opposite attitude, take a positive attitude? 
you know, it doesn't hurt to say hello to a stranger. You know, I think of Russ Dietrich. There's, you talk about a man in a community. I think of Russ. Whenever Russ enters a room, there is no stranger in that room. None whatsoever. <laughs> and everybody should take that attitude. Why do you want to... Some, someone asked me once about bringing a guest to the studio and just giving them two minutes or three minutes. And I thought, I'm not going to bring somebody who's going out of his way to get there, maybe travel five miles or so, and then just devote 120 seconds to them. I don't... I, I just don't see that as being fair and, and just. Uh, and I don't ever intend to interview anybody that uh, certainly you can pick out a piece of legislation they may have passed, or particularly politicians. But I don't ever want to ask what they call a gotcha question. I don't go there to diminish anybody. I get under, you know, we all get up in the morning, and really, basically, we all, we all think the same thing. We want the day to be productive, maybe a day where we can create new friendships, a day where you appreciate your family, and you just want that day to be as normal as possible. That's all. I, you don't want to get up in the morning and wish something goes wrong with somebody's life. I mean, who wants to, who wants to take that attitude? Because that person is doing what you want to do. That person wants the job to be fulfilling, meaningful, enough to take care of his family's needs, and maybe have a little discretionary income to enjoy a vacation or taking the wife out for dinner. What else is there? You know, you're, you're sleeping six hours of your life every day or seven or eight hours, and you've got 14 hours or whatever's left. Why do you want to fill it with anything but what can be positive and what can be right? I, I, that's, that's the way I feel. I, uh, when I look at the headlines every day and, and right at this very moment, when I think people in uh, Syria are dying or children are dying in Israel and Gaza and terrible Dictators are killing people in Africa. Take Jim Johnson, right here, the executive director. The prosecutor, it's Sierra Leone, trying to bring Charlie Taylor to justice, a man who killed millions. It is incomprehensible to me that anybody is put on this earth to kill millions of people. For what? when he could turn around and make lives so much richer with good programs and, and good government. That's my speech for the day, folks. <laughs> because you mentioned Jim Johnson, the Robert Jackson Center, uh, you, we, we want to memorialize this magic moment, Jim, and so we have a mug here. And before you sign off on your normal sign off at the end of the day, which is the end of most people's day, you know, it's final, I just want to give you this mug because what it says on the back is something which is true to you. This is a quote from Justice Robert H. Jackson, and he said from the Supreme Court, we are not final because we are infallible, but we are infallible only because we are final. And Jim, you have the final word. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. And I could take a moment here because I see so many wonderful people and friends that I've made over the years, and I'm so grateful for their relationship with me. Uh, 
I, uh, I just take one quick thought with the way I, I look at my day. I start the day by welcoming people to the broadcast, and I, I just try to put something in place maybe that'll give you a little more enthusiasm. When I welcome you in the morning, it's welcome to uh, broadcast for August the 4th in the year 2014, which happens to be the first day of the rest of your life. And I think maybe that attitude might get you started. I end the program by saying, thank you for your company. Take good care of this day. Live, love, and enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Rosano. the right ones, buddy. <laughs> now, we have a couple of books to give away, Randy. <laughs>